John Noe unveils Greater Than We Believe with your host, Stephen King. Well, hello again. It's good to see you. My name is Stephen King. This is my friend John Noe. We're coming back with more. <laughs> we always have more, don't we? <laughs> um, we've been we've really enjoyed the series so far. We've been speaking on the subject based on this book, Hell Yes, Hell No, which John wrote back in 2010. We published it in 2011. Um, the subject we've been sp on has been the last half of the book, which is called The All Controversy. Mm -hmm. And we've spent many, many, many weeks now going through every facet of that necessary. This has been a long discussion because it needed to be that way. We, yes. we, there was so much, so much divisiveness in the body of Christ about the word all and what, how the Bible uses it and what it can and can't mean and so forth and so on. Amen. So uh, we actually brought it to fruition last week as far as the playlist goes. But John felt very strongly that even though he ended his book there, he, uh, he, he originally was going to, he needed to add us a last part to kind of sum everything up, to talk more about what we've been talking. We use the term the post-mortem experience, or we were using the term uh, post-mortem evangelism, post-mortem salvation. There's a lot of ways, but post-mortem means after death mm -hmm. in the flesh. So John's going to take and give us um, I think five, at least five videos, and and then we're going to wrap it up after that mm -hmm. to for this particular playlist. So we, John, we're, we're, this video is number two thirty five, the all controversy, the post mortem experience, part one. Yes. So let's uh, let's get into this discussion and see what we can glean from it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. Okay. Well, welcome everybody once again <laughs> to the postmortem experience. Doesn't yes. that sound exciting? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Someday, each and every one of us, believers and unbelievers, will face, go through, and dwell forever in the postmortem experience. Mm -hmm. Today, if this is a line, this is the dot. This has been used. We're living in the dot. Mm -hmm. But his is a post-mortem mm -hmm. experience. On and on and on and on and on. It's the afterlife destiny of every person. You believe that? I do. You believe that? Uh, who's ever lived or is now living or will live on planet Earth in the future. Individually, you and I will stand before the judgment seat of God mm -hmm. and give an account, will we not? To God, Romans 14.10, don't read that, okay. it is quoted, and 11. Then and there we will receive what is due to us for the things that we have done, whether good or bad, mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians 510. Mm -hmm. See, I'm not making this stuff up, yeah. Stephen. <laughs> okay. Jesus uh, amplified this experience like this. If you would read, please, Matthew 12, 36 through 37. Matthew 12, 36 through 37. And it says, um, but I tell you that men will have to give account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. And not only words, but yes. as we shall actions see it, and actions too. And no one is exempt. Despite this use of the masculine language, not even females mm -hmm. are exempt. Twice. On the opposite side, this encouraging tidbit has also been revealed, if you would read 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 10. 9 through 10 says, However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, 
No mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him, but God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. Yes, and that's from Isaiah 64, 4. Now on the negative side, this judgment event will not only involve Stephen blessings and reward, but also, guess what? Loss and possible punishment. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not making this mm -hmm. up. 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15, if you would, please. Um, 11 through 15. For no one can, can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. So are we talking about unbelievers or believers? Well, this in this case, uh, believers, obviously. Well, unbelievers, too. Well, them, too. As, as we will see. Yeah. As we, no, okay. And how all this transpires for each person, saved or unsaved, Stephen, has not been revealed. But this universal reality and the administration of that process has been the subject of many debates mm -hmm. over the centuries. I mean, many. Pro and con. Nevertheless, this post-mortem experience is both the challenge and the theme of our last chapter mm -hmm. in this book, Hell Yes and No, Hell No, Hell Yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> and in this series mm -hmm. that we're doing now. And in keeping with the results of our synthesis that we uh, did in our prior, prior video, uh, we are going to re-explore here how God might, could, and may possibly save all people mm -hmm. as they go through this afterlife experience. After all, emphatically and on numerous occasions, God has stated that he will carry this out and, the, and, and that his plan, he will accomplish his plan. And he will accomplish everything that he wills, desires, and purposes that none should perish. Yes. But every person be saved and come to the knowledge of truth and repentance. Do you think I made that up? No. Nope. First Timothy two four and second Peter three nine. That's don't read that yet. Mm -hmm. We'll just I'll just cite them. And the culmination of this process is the Godhead being all in all. First Corinthians fifteen twenty eight. And even more challenging, brothers and sisters, if possible, we are going to re-explore how our omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent God might, could, and may cause all people who haven't done so to accept Christ. Mm -hmm. <laughs> willingly and freely. Yes. And I put willingly and freely in quotation marks yes. for a reason you will see mm -hmm. as we proceed. In the afterlife without violating anybody's so-called free will. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that? I do. Talbot, in his book, Universal Salvation, The Current Debate, if you would read... In yellow, page five, there, uh, affirms that God is... He is also wise and resourceful enough to accomplish all of his loving purposes in the end. Really? Do you know what he purposes? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get to that. Erickson reminds us of the reason why all this might, could, and may be possible. If you will read uh, page 73 in yellow. It says, The omnipotence of God, His ability to accomplish His ends fully, is a vital part of the salvation of all persons. The will of God extends beyond this life. 
Wow, isn't that something? Mm -hmm. Well, so let me ask you, brothers and sisters, how might, could, and may God soften all the hearts that he had previously hardened? Mm. And who hardened them? Mm. God did. Mm -hmm. So how can he soften them? And he had previously done this throughout history. So how might and could God draw and enable in the afterlife those whom in this life he did not draw and enable? Mm -hmm. Or those who never heard? How about those? Or those who heard and refused? How about those? Mm -hmm. To believe and receive. John 6 45 through 65. How might, could, and may he graft back in all those he previously broke mm. off? Mm -hmm. Romans 11, 17 through 23. How might, could, and may he unbind those he had bound mm. over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all? Romans 11, 32. How might, could, and may he punish or treat the wicked, even Judas and Hitler, so that they would longingly and sincerely desire to be righteous and saved? Mm. Well, there is one more sticky little issue, <laughs> or not so little, depending upon your perspective, that... Uh, Many, if not most believers, Stephen, who have confessed Christ as their Savior in this life have been told, taught, and think they will completely avoid God's wrath and punishment. And upon physical death, go instantly into the blissful paradise of heaven. And maybe some will. Mm -hmm. But biblically, it has been revealed that the souls of many, if not all, believers may not be ready to receive hmm. and to enjoy the blessings of heaven immediately after they die. Hmm. Plenty of scriptures warn about all this and warn that we will be held accountable. Guess what for? For what we have done and what we have not done in this life. And some unpleasant afterlife consequences are possible. Then, after we've faced and undergone the judgment, mm -hmm. Hebrews 9.27, Romans 14.10-12, 2 Corinthians 5.10, uh, here are several additional verses from the New Testament that, that many ignore. Hmm or lightly brush aside, which seem to teach this truth. Mark, if you would, 949. Everyone will be salted with fire. Ooh, everyone. Everyone? Yeah. Even Hitler and... All of us. Judas and mm -hmm. all of us. Luke 12, 47 through 48. Twelve forty-seven through forty-eight. Right. Okay, so the next page. Um, that servant who knows his master's will and does not get ready or does not do what his master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does do and does things deser deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. So the principle there to follow is, you'd be wise not to know much. <laughs> right? Yeah. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. And 49? Well, hold on a minute. Okay. Oh, 48. I'm sorry. Have you been entrusted with much? Yes. Well, guess what? Much will be expected from yes. you. Okay, next. Well, well, where are you at now? No, I just read the I read it. Okay. Matthew 25 then. If you would go to Matthew 25. Yes. 41 through 45. No, we're not making this stuff up, folks. 
We're just reading the scripture. 25, 41 through 45. Uh huh. Down to here. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Notice he didn't say hell. Right. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger to you, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. Did you ever do any of that stuff, folks? Hmm. Keep reading. It says, Please. Then they will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry when did or I, thirsty? When did I not do this? Yeah, or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you. He will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Wow. Con and Sprinkle in her book, Erasing Hell, said this. It is arguably, I call, one of the most troubling, uh, and, and we'll get to one of the most troubling passages in Scripture in a minute. He said, this, these are the scariest passages in the entire Bible. Hmm. Wow. Matthew 7. Here's another one. Matthew 7, 22 through 23. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. Did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never even knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Wow. Where to? Where would they go if they got to go away from you, me, my evildoers? How about Hebrews 12, 29? Hebrews 12, 29. Time for a new Bible. <laughs> this one's coming apart. 1229 says, For our God is a consuming fire. Yeah, that's not the only place it says that. Mm -hmm. Deuteronomy 424 and mm -hmm. Isaiah 33, 14 as well. Yes. So really, is a believer in Christ immune to all this? Hmm or some of this, or none of these negative consequences in the afterlife. Baker, in her book, Raising Hell, certainly recognizes this possibility. If you would read, please, on page 122, this possibility that everyone may, everyone. They stand in the fiery presence of God and suffer the purifying flames of God's love, this burning love might feel like a burning wrath to the one who experiences it. And since everyone is a sinner, Stephen, mm -hmm. including you and me, mm -hmm. even those of us already saved by grace, this fire may just be God's, if you'll read the second one. His love that burns away the sin. Read Purif that again. It's love that burns away the sin purifying the sinner so that true reconciliation and restoration can take place. You believe that? I do. You believe God's that big and that bad? Mm. He has that much loving. And loving? Mm -hmm. But I also think that we believers can rest assured, Stephen, that this divine use of fire is good for us because everything God does is good, right, and just. And this post-mortem experience, whatever it may be and whatever it may entail, will likewise be good, right, and just for us. Can you believe that? Mm -hmm. Can you believe that? Because he is a loving father. Yes. And we are all made in his image and likeness. And we can also rest assured that God in his omniscience, that means all-knowing, mm -hmm. knows what will work best in each of our cases and what will bring about the desired results. So how might, could, and may all this positive and negative stuff happen in a post-mortem experience and everybody eventually be saved? Hmm. To us, this outcome seems impossible. But never forget, Nothing is 
impossible mm -hmm. for God or with God. Yes. I didn't make that up either. Mm. Luke 1, 37, also 18, 27, Matthew 19, 26, and Mark 10, 27. And according to many other scriptures, he works both in this world and in this life and in the afterlife, post-mortem. Stenson, if you would read page 104, Stenson, of course, has no problem. Oh, let me show, show that. Christian Universalist. Uh, he has no problem believing that God can do all this. That's why he is so sure that some people will be saved during their earthly life, while others will not be saved until after physical death. Wow. And once again, this fulfillment is the reconciliation of all things and is Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, according to the plan of him who works out some things in conformity with his purpose and will. I misread that. Who works out everything. Everything, yeah. Everything includes this stuff we're talking about yes. here. Does it not? Yes. All right. Here's my, here's my cautious disclaimer, folks. Granted, the content of this final chapter in Hell Yes, Hell No, uh, these, and these final videos that we're doing, this one and, what, four more, mm -hmm. something like that, uh, is speculative. It is speculative, but it is not pure speculation. What's more, I'm not the first person in church history to speculate about these things. Mm -hmm. Far from it. Uh, these possible afterlife scenarios and experiences have been documented throughout church history. And Stenson, as Stenson observes, you still have Stenson there? Yeah, I got 104 and I got 100. 100, right? All right. As Stenson historically observes, if you would, early Christians held a great diversity of views about the nature of the afterlife. So this is a subject of much debate. Yeah. Much debate. Yes. Pro and con, hostile and fierce. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately not too loving mm -hmm. when, when this is debated. Therefore, and in addition to prominent early church fathers like Clement of Alexandria and Origen particularly, that's look at some writings from the late 1800s from recent Christian writers. And notwithstanding, I make no pretense that the contents we are about to cover are either right or exhaustive, only that they are all scripturally possible. Mm -hmm. Let me say that again. I don't make any, any pretense that these contents about what we're about to cover are right or exhaustive, only that they are all scripturally possible. Mm -hmm. I also can assure you that nothing will be, that we will be re-exploring herein violates or contradicts any text or demand of scripture that I'm aware of. And if you're aware of something that I'm contradicting, I want to know about it. Mm -hmm. Nor does it compromise God's character and nature. Right. If anything, the material contained herein only enhances our perception of God's divine attributes. Hence, the bottom line is and must remain that God is fully free to use these or any other methodologies he so chooses to achieve his revealed will, desire, and purpose. And that is that none should perish, but every person be saved and come into the knowledge of truth and repentance. 1 Timothy 2.4, 2 Timothy 3.9. Yes. Ferguson... Uh, writing in Morgan and Peterson's book, Hell Under Fire, if you would to turn to page 236, agrees with what I just said. Mm. <laughs> How about that? And offers some wise caution in this regard, if you would read what I've marked there. We must recognize that what God may do is not limited to what he has revealed to us that he will do. By the same token, we may not presume that he will do what he has not specifically revealed that he will do. <laughs> now, is that double talk or, or what? Yeah. Or is he double talking to double 
intensify the importance of this. Not limited. Let me read that again. We must recognize that what God may do is not limited to what he has revealed to us that he will do. So that's, there's no limit on what he can do. There you says, go. But by the same token, we may not presume that he will do what he has not specifically revealed that he will do. So we can only speculate. If he hasn't said anything about it, we don't. We can't say he will. We can only speculate. Or we can't say he won't. This is true. Either way. Well, either way. Okay. Consequently, the purpose of our last set of videos that we're pursuing, and this is the first of mm -hmm. those, uh, and it's from the final chapter in Hell Yes, Hell No, is to offer insights and explanations and methodologies as to how God might and could and may bring about the salvation of all human beings eventually. Mm -hmm. And again, this was the belief of the, of the Christian church for the first 500 years of its existence, as we've talked about in previous videos. No, this will not be a cogent and systematic account. Remember, we are dealing here with a mystery. Mm -hmm. And the three major areas we will be exploring are, one, the unhardening, and regrafting process. Number two, the functions of fire. And number three, God's insanity plan. Hmm. That sound yeah. worth uh, pursuing? Yes. I hope you agree. As you will see, these possible post-mortem experiences are not an end in themselves, but a means to an end. As we proceed, please keep in the forefront of your mind this question. Why would God create a person in his image and likeness, Genesis 1, 26 through 27, and yet with a soul that he would never seek him? Hmm. Of course, on earth there are some deluded and seduced by sin, selfishness, or evil temptations, but after physical death, many, if not all, of those fleshly things that kept us away from God will have been removed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it could be a whole new ball game post mortem. Post mortem, yes. Could it not? And so to speak. There, in the post mortem afterlife, the human soul is liberated from the earthly flesh. And perhaps it already is or will someday be contained in a new spiritual body. 1 Corinthians 15.44 Either way, as McDonald suggests in his book, The Evangelical Universalist, if you'll turn to page 161, either way, McDonald suggests that... 161? 161. Uh -huh. Did I not give you that one? I didn't. Oh, here it is. All right. The, okay, obviously post, the post-mortem state in which most, most, let me start over, please. All right, go ahead. <laughs> the post-mortem state in which most turn to God is vastly better suited for the con conversation of the unregenerate. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. Must be better suited. For believers... Ladies and gentlemen, mm -hmm. this experience may also be overwhelming. Mm -hmm. But before we jump in, Steve, he stay, keep it there. Mm -hmm. Go to 101. Before we jump in, Stephen Stevenson, <laughs> I'm getting Stevenson messed up with Stephen here, mm -hmm. offers this final bit of wisdom. 101. In yellow. There's nothing on 101. Ah, uh, isn't there anything on 101? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, here. Did I fail to mark that? I must have failed to mark that. Here, read it right there. Regardless of one's beliefs about how the afterlife works, what really matters is that God knows what's best for each and every soul he has created. I believe that God will put us wherever we need to be at any particular time, whether on earth or in hell, <laughs> or somewhere else unknown, until we have reached the full statue of divinity that we were created to reflect and manifest in our lives. Well, will he or won't he? I think his will will be done either way. Well, 
If you are ready for a possible preview of this ultimate adventure, mm -hmm. which I, that's not an understatement at mm -hmm. all, let's now see how all this might, could, and may be worked out yeah. by the Godhead in the successful achievement of God's stated will, desire, and purpose in every single case yes. that all should come into redemption. Yes. I wouldn't want to miss our next video, Father you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. I hope you don't miss it. Folks, we, um, we're coming pretty close to the end of this, this particular playlist, and I hope by now everybody's on board with at least, before we did this playlist, we were doing hell yes, hell no. At that point, we had basically proven scripturally and everywhere else that the, the idea of a fiery burning eternal conscious torment that people call hell is non-existent <laughs> so that begged the question well if people don't go to hell that aren't saved or whatever what happens to them and that's the all controversy that's what we've been talking about what would happen to people that didn't get the chance to uh, to know Jesus so that's what we're, we've been pursuing with the all controversy. Mm. And we kept bringing up post-mortem, post-mortem, mm. post-mortem. So mm. what we're doing here is, I have to say, probably the majority of what we're speaking about here is, is, is an, an idealism of what could be. Just like what that guy I read twice, he was basically saying, we can't say, you know, just because God hasn't said something doesn't mean he can't do it. He, he can do anything he wants, whether he's told us about it. He can't it or violate right. what he said. But he won't, right. right. But if he hasn't told us about what he's going to do, that doesn't mean that since he didn't tell us, he can't do whatever he wants to do. And also, by the same token, when God has been silent on something, that doesn't mean he can't do anything about it. He doesn't have to get our permission. So there is a lot of silence in this post-mortem discussion. The early church knew that. Mm. So we have to just basically take everything on the, on the idea of whether this goes against Scripture, if it goes against what he's revealed, if it goes against his nature, and if it goes against his the character of God. And so please listen with open mind and heart. Come back next week. We'll continue the discussion. We pray for you. We hope you pray for this ministry. We love you, and we'll see you next week. Okay.